Okay, let's get to global warming. A lot to say about global warming. Uh, there are anecdotes. So don't, again, rhetorical question, but think of something that you know of from your own experience that illustrates global warming. And, and most people can come up with something like that. Forgive me for the following slide. This is, it's, it, this is not serious. Here's something else. Uh, we're somewhere near here. This is uh, looking east on Durant, 1885. This is Berkeley. That's where the university is growing and, and so on. And here are some farms. Farms in Berkeley? Uh, and you'll notice the snow on the hills. Yeah, things have warmed up a bit. OK, you never see that anymore. Here's global warming. This is the evidence. It's a, uh, an organization you need to know called the IPCC. The IPCC stands for the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You don't have to know that. You have to know the IPCC is the scientific consensus that everybody refers to. Typical talk on global warming refers to the consensus. There is a consensus. Then they start telling you their own opinions. And you don't realize they're not talking about the consensus. This is global warming. This is the main evidence for global warming. The IPCC takes three bits of evidence. One of them is the rise of sea level. One of them is the melting of the Arctic ice. And the third and most powerful are the temperature records taken from thermometers. So this is global warming. The, interestingly, in the latest report of the IPCC, 2007, the warming from the 1850s until 1957 is no longer attributed to humans in the IPCC report. That's because it really could be variations in the uh, in, in, the, in the activity of the sun. And it's not much of a rise in the activity of the sun was going up, so that could be that. We don't know, but it could be. The calculations that we have that go back to 1896 indicate that this probably is simply not human cause. Although many people will tell you about the warming starting in the 1800s, how this started coming in. The, science, the consensus of the IPCC is, no, you can't really attribute that to the humans. From 1957 on, however, the solar activity went down, and the warming kept on going up. So the IPCC concludes that this is the global warming. This is what's happening here. And I, I, you know, my own opinion, I concur. Uh, so let's focus in on this most recent stuff, because I asked you about your experience. Just think of the last 10 years. Think of things that happened in the last 10 years. Don't say out loud that might be attributed to global warming. Okay, now, you notice the trend is going up, but there are all these fits and spurts, right? It goes up and down and up and down. So what happened in the last 10 years? I download this every month. I checked just earlier today to see if the latest month was there. It wasn't. So here's the, here's, this is global warming for the past 10 years. This is in degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, if we go back to this one, you'll notice that the temperature rise is about 2 degrees Fahrenheit, out of which 1 degree Fahrenheit is attributed to humans. It's less than most people think. One degree Fahrenheit, how much of that is due to the US? We have done far more than our fair share in terms of population. We've probably contributed a quarter of that. So the US is responsible for a quarter of a degree Fahrenheit. And if we continue in the same way, we will be responsible for another quarter of a degree Fahrenheit over the next 30 or 40 years. Is that what we worry about? No, what we worry about is going up five, seven, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the global warming that we think is coming. It's not going to be coming from the US. Even if we don't sign Kyoto, it's not going to be coming from the US. It will be more than our fair share. We have no right, well, by population, to contribute another quarter of a degree. But, but you need to know where this, by the way, so the global warming of the last 10 years, it, there hasn't been any. But it's just a fluctuation. I believe it's a fluctuation, like these fluctuations, up and down and up and down and up and down. The temperature in this period has not gone up. That doesn't mean global warming isn't real. Global warming is real. Five years ago, I wrote an article about this. I said, look, I've talked to the experts. Most of them agree we could have 10 years of, 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 of no warming. And unless you let the public know that this is a possibility and it doesn't deny global warming, you're going to start losing people from your argument. The trouble is the U.S. public doesn't pay attention unless you exaggerate. And so people have done that, particularly politicians. 
This is the IPC. This is the consensus. This is the scientific consensus, the IPCC report. This is a quote. Basically, it says the climate change of the past 50 years is very likely not due to no natural causes alone. By 90%, that means there's a 10% chance it is due to natural causes. This isn't my opinion. This is the consensus. It's usually not quoted because most people want to scare their audience and they fear they will not respond unless they say it's imminent and, 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 and huge and 100% likely. Well, anyway, that's not the scientific consensus. Uh, Al Gore is one who does this, and he got a Nobel Prize for alerting the US public and frightening the US public to do something about this urgent problem. But he did it, quite frankly, by exaggerating. Uh, there's the difference between his statement and what the scientists say. So I think you can handle the truth. The truth is, so far, global warming has been very small, but that doesn't mean that it's not real. Why do they say 90% chance rather than 100% chance. Why, don't they, why doesn't the, the scientists say incontrovertible? And the reason is there's a big unknown called cloud cover. If cloud cover grows, then it could actually undo global warming. So as, as it gets hotter, you get more evaporation from the oceans. Evaporation from the oceans uh, could create more clouds. We don't think they do. But it's hard to rule out. And that's why they give only a 90% confidence level, because 2% change in the cloud cover. Uh, the, here are the detailed science things, which I won't go through right now. But but, uh, but the, the uncertainty in global warming, could it be that the human caused global warming is in this range, or could it actually be all the way down to zero? The uncertainty all depends on the cloud cover. Anyway, let me not spend any more time on this, a lot of things. This is the expected global warming. This is why we worry. Uh, I blocked this thing out because this, this is the famous hockey stick controversy in which I played a major role, and, and just uh, these data are now uh, basically flawed and known to be based on a computer bug, so forget that. But this was in the IPC 2001 report. I can go into excruciating detail on that because I was involved in that. But the, the temperature rise, this is what we expect. And this is the range. Of course, there is some chance it'll be zero, and I'm praying for that. The reason I'm praying that it's not human caused is because I don't see any of our political leaders taking the action necessary to really do anything about this. That's a, not a physics comment. Okay, so let's move on. Some people say that global warming is based on all sorts of complicated computer calculations. Not true. It goes back to 1896 when Arrhenius did the first calculations. He showed doubling of CO2. He was the first scientist to really look at this. Doubling of CO2 would raise the temperature by 3 degrees Celsius. Um, and then Roger Revelle, Revelle College down in San Diego, a fellow that, I, that, that, that I'm honored to have, have, have known, uh, in, 18, in 1958, raised the issue again. He's the modern father of global warming. And he inspired a calculation done by some colleagues of mine, which is, I still think, the best scientific look at the subject. And they concluded that Arrhenius was right. Doubling of CO2, and we're going to get there, we're going to get there in 30 or 40 years, we're going to double the CO2, will raise the temperature by, by 3 degrees Celsius. Uh, the IPCC report, they used huge computer calculations, independent teams all doing the same thing. What they basically did is verify that Arrhenius was right. So we are not dependent on sophisticated, complex computer calculations. Back of the envelope calculation says, we really got to worry. We're now increasing the carbon dioxide. Uh, let me skip to this. Uh, well, here, let me go back here. Uh, went one, one too far. Okay, there's a lot of thing in the news about the hurricane, in, in, increase in hurricanes. A complicated shot. You, you probably all know that hurricanes are increasing uh, due to global warming. Um, hurricanes are also increasing because we have better observation of hurricanes. Uh, Katrina was a category three hurricane when it hit the coast. It was category five when it was out at sea. We call it category five because that's the maximum it ever got to. We're much better at observing these things. So there's a bias. We're observing more hurricanes because now we have the whole Atlantic Ocean covered with buoys and with satellites. So we see these hurricanes. So how much of the hurricane increase is due to better observation? There's one way that scientists typically handle this problem. And what they do is they take what's called an unbiased sample. Let's just consider the hurricanes that hit the United States. We observe those all the time. And when we observe them, they're not missed. So you could look up in the almanac at the hurricanes hitting the United States, and here's the record. The black lines are all the hurricanes by decade, and you can see the hurricanes hitting the United States have been going down a little bit. 
The really intense storms, the category four and five storms, that's this light gray thing. And uh, statistically, they've been going down too. Hurricanes increase. The IPCC does not use that as a bit of evidence for global warming, because if you look at it scientifically, there's no evidence that, that in an unbiased sample, hurricanes are increasing. It doesn't mean global warming isn't real. But if you start cherry picking and picking every bit of evidence that sounds bad and attributed to global warming, you make a much stronger case and you're much more likely to get the public. Here's a view of hurricanes of 19, uh, what's it, 1933. There were none out here. Now there are lots. It's purely observational bias. The cost of hurricanes has been going up. Uh, but not if you take into account the fact that we're putting much more expensive houses on the coast. Take that into account and you find the whole cost of hurricanes has not been going up when compensated for inflation and for the, uh, this is one of the things that I object to in what Al Gore does. He shows a plot like this. It's not this plot, but he shows the cost of hurricanes going up and he did not compensate for inflation. So it makes a very effective slide, but uh, Greenland is melting. This is the observed rise in sea level. This is one of the key data points for global warming. It's going up, 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 up. Relatively steady. It doesn't go through those fits and spurts. So this is something to truly worry about. It's one of the three elements of data that the IPC depends on. We can, based on this, which matches the observed global warming, we can predict how much the sea level will go up. And here are the predictions. This is from the Hadley Center, which is one of the major centers done in the IPCC. And here's the expected sea level rise. And you can see it goes up by 600, six meters by the year 3000. By the year 2100, goes up a couple feet. You need to know that the consensus is that sea level rise will not be a serious problem to Florida, to New York City, to places like that in the next 100 years. There are some islands in the Pacific that will be affected. But this is the consensus. If you see a film that shows New York City being flooded, it's, it's all based on the hypothesis, which is not part of the consensus, that Greenland will become unstable and all the ice will flow into the sea, or Antarctica. The consensus is that that's not going to happen. Antarctica, well, so there, <laughs> Antarctic ice is melting. Uh, um, it, it turns out that in 2001, the IPCC uh, had their computer people predict how much the Antarctic ice would melt due to global warming. And what they concluded was, it wouldn't melt, that because of evaporation from the oceans, you would actually have an ice buildup in Antarctica. And every one of the computer models predicted the same thing, an ice buildup in Antarctica. Then a couple years ago, what year was this? 2006. A couple years ago, an article came out showing that the opposite was happening, that ice was decreasing in Antarctica by 36 cubic miles per year. It's a lot of ice going away. It was widely reported as confirming global warming. The IPCC doesn't use it because it's exactly opposite to what you'd expect from global warming. So these anecdotes, I, I, I caution you uh, not to, I mean, the fires on, you know, last night, the, 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 the fire on Angel Island, ready, you're ready to attribute everything to global warming, but the IPCC has to be careful. Alaska is an interesting case. There's Alaska. This is the data. This is at Fairbanks. This is a smooth data. Typically, they'll plot a line like this showing global warming that's going up in Alaska. If you look at data in the North Atlantic, you find the temperature has undergone a big jump. They call this a regime change, OK? And they don't understand it. But you can, you can come up with models that will explain it. The interesting thing is it's very similar to what happened in Alaska. And so Alaska has been warm you know, for the last 25 years, but it hasn't gotten warmer. In fact, uh, I was at a meeting just last week in which one of the Alaska scientists showed me data showing that the temperature in Alaska now is equal to the temperature average of the last 20 years. Um, so Alaska is warm, but it's not warming. Uh, wildfires. Uh, I, this is one where I wrote to Al Gore. I tried to call him. I tried to contact him. He says that they're going up. Uh, if you look up the data published by the US government every year, they have an official report. Uh, it's going down. This is a, uh, I don't, I, he hasn't gotten back to me on that. Uh, uh, then there's the tornadoes. Now, it could be possible that what he's doing is picking, he says they're going up and the data says they're going down. These are only the strong to violent ones, the ones that actually land and do damage. It could be that the reason he says they're going up could be due to a bias uh, from the fact that we're observing tornadoes much better now with radar than we used to. But the tornadoes, 
why would storms go down with global warming? Everybody says you have more heat, that's more energy. Well, storms come about from temperature differences. And it's equally plausible, because we know the poles warm up more than the equator, that you're reducing the temperature differences. And so you could ima imagine the storms going down. We don't know which will happen. But the evidence so far is that the storms have been going down. Uh, I fear that you will lose interest in global warming. And global warming is real. And there are those fluctuations. Now, in the last remaining two minutes, what can we do about it? Well, here's the problem. Carbon dioxide, very likely the cause of global warming, has been going up, up, up. Here's the US, more than our share. You know, one quarter of the car is going up, 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 up. Here we are. And we're beginning to slow down a little bit. You can see we're not rising as quickly as we used to be. But here are the developing countries, mostly China. And they have really taken off. Suppose we cut down to the Kyoto levels, 1990 levels. That's right here. Suppose we cut down to that and even go below that. And we go right here. We'll cut out this much global warming. And China and India will make up for that in three years. So we can feel good. I own a Prius. My class, that gets me applause. <laughs> <laughs> I, our house is all compact fluorescent bulbs. These are really nice feel-good measures. But if we make America completely green, all we're going to do is set an example for China and hope that they will follow and not first follow our other example, which is our standard of living. OK, more evidence that they are really taking off. This is it's called the non-OECD countries. These are the OECD. ED country, OECD countries, and, and they're, they're really dominating. Part of the problem is that coal is dirt cheap, uh, and so, and they have lots of coal, and China's building, last year, 70 power plants, 70, each one the size of our biggest nuclear power generators, a, 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 a gigawatt in each plant, and they're making these out of coal, and they're dirty. To take off my physics hat for a second, put on my political hat, you know, I, I, personally, I see the only solution is we have to pay for them to use clean technology. They, they have no responsibility to do that. They're, they're, they're poor. Uh, the wealthy countries have to do it. This is what I would love to see our politicians suggesting, but I suspect that either politician who said we have to send $100 billion to China for clean technology would guarantee his loss in the election. OK, uh, conservation is the easy thing. This is a photograph I took of Notre Dame. And I took it of the chandelier here just to bring back and give a copy to my friend Art Rosenfeld, who was, along with Sam Berman and some others, the creator of the compact fluorescent light bulb. It came out of the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the compact fluorescent light bulb. And now the chandelier's in Notre Dame. If you don't believe compact fluorescence can be beautiful, well, think of Notre Dame. OK, so conservation is the real winner. Uh, there's so much you could be said about this. It's the easy thing to do. We have to do it ourselves. It, 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 you make money by conserving. Uh, we have to pay for China, too. Maybe we can make some money on that. Uh, these are the various things that you could do. And, and, and uh, efficiency is one of these rainbows or one of these wedges. Using renewables as some, nuclear as some. I hate it when my friends start arguing that we shouldn't have nuclear because we should do it with renewables. Realistically, we need everything. Let's not argue among ourselves as to which one of our green solutions is more righteous. That just does harm. McKinsey showed that it's <laughs> really cheap. You save money by doing conservation. Uh, this is the inefficiency. This is how much energy you use for a given unit of GNP. And the countries that are doing the worst, of course, are the developing countries. Developing countries always do badly. China and India, uh, the US is down there. And if we use conservation measures and get China to use them too, we could be using less energy by the year 2100 than we are now, less energy per year and yet have every single Chinese and Indian person living at the European standard of living. So there's great reason for optimism. Anyway, let me just finish up. Clean coal is not an oxymoron. Yes, you can do it. Uh, uh, it means taking the carbon dioxide and putting it underground. I believe this is a feasible technology. I think it's one of the more straightforward technologies. People say it's unproven, but it, I think it is less unproven than many of the other things that people would like to do. Um,
There's some more details on it. Solar cells are coming along really quickly. I, I think we're going to, entering a really exciting period of solar cells. Wind turbines, see those two pictures there? Those are to the same scale. That's an eight megawatt wind turbine in Germany. And uh, T. Boone Pickens is right about that. We have a good wind corridor in the US. We just have to find ways to bring that energy back to the cities where they need it. So let me finish up. The public needs to know this stuff. Most of this is completely nonpartisan. Uh, it doesn't have to be taught with spin. But I, I would like, I, th I think what we need to do is to agree on the <laughs> physics. I'd love to see the president every month say, today we're going to have some physics discussion, or maybe some chemistry or biology. And I'm, I'm going to give you the, 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 the true non-spin stuff. I'm not going to put, this is going to be nonpartisan. Non Let's just for an hour talk about the things you really need to know. We'll agree on the physics and then you can decide on you know, nuclear waste. And at that point, once we've agreed on the facts and the levels of radioactivity and what they are, then you may decide you don't trust these people to handle the nuclear waste. And that's, that's fine. That, 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 but that's, that's the politics and the trust aspect of it. The physics we should agree on. We should know we're all radioactive, what the levels are, and what levels cause cancer, and how this compares, and all that kind of stuff. So likewise on terrorism, likewise on energy. You know, we need to know, the public needs to know that, that batteries, if they can be improved, are very important, because then we can have automobiles without gasoline but that batteries have to be improved by a big factor before China and India can afford them. So uh, here are some of the things I didn't touch on. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there are, there are lots. Uh, some of these things go into, into my book. But uh, in the end, uh, if you want more, go to my webpage, www.muller.lbl for Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory gov, and you'll find links to my class and, and, and everything else. So at this point, all I can say is good luck in your campaign. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm ready for some lively questions. Yes.